In this video, we're going to discuss the concept of nuclear stability. We're going to try and determine why some atoms remain intact for very long periods of time, whereas other atoms break down, give off radiation in relatively short spans of time. Let's start by discussing a couple learning objectives. Uh, first, we're going to recap uh, some nuclear structure. We're going to talk about some of the ideas covered in previous videos. We're then going to identify forces acting inside of the nucleus. These forces are going to be the driving factor behind whether an atom is stable or unstable. Once we've identified what the forces are, we need to associate these forces with individual particles, which then finally will allow us to identify a nucleus as being stable or not based on the ratio of protons or neutrons, those are our particles, as well as a balance of the forces involved. Let's recap some of the nuclear structure concepts that we've covered in previous videos. On the left, we have a very stylized image of an atom reflecting Bohr's model. Um, despite not being a very accurate picture, I think it's a good way of recapping some of the ideas we had. Uh, as you can see, we have a very dense nucleus in the center where our protons and neutrons reside, uh, surrounded by a less dense, or much less dense, cloud of electrons orbiting. What we haven't talked about in previous videos is that the structure continues into the nucleus itself. Um, nucleons arrange themselves into shells, into energy levels, in the similar way that electrons do uh, in the atom itself. This arrangement uh, leads to stability, just like the arrangement of electrons leads to stability of an atom or a molecule. Uh, and this stability is what we're really getting into today. Um, a quick way of kind of giving an example of that, we have the concept of magic numbers. Uh, scientists have found uh, that certain numbers of protons and neutrons, certain quantities of nucleons, result in very, very stable nuclei, nuclei that last for millions and billions of years. A quick list of these magic numbers would be 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. The numbers themselves are not very valuable to you in terms of what we're going to be talking about, but what we're pointing out here is that this, these arrangements, these certain quantities of protons and neutrons uh, result in atoms that are very stable. Uh, our job in this video is to identify why certain combinations of protons and neutrons are stable, whereas other combinations are not. To get at that explanation, we're going to start talking about forces. Uh, to start, let's talk about all four forces that exist in our universe. This is something you should have covered back in physics in your previous year. Uh, our four forces would be gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. Now in your previous physics classes you probably talked a lot about gravity and you probably talked a lot about electromagnetism and probably not so much about these two guys. Um, in this particular discussion we're going to focus on these two. Uh, electromagnetism, uh, if you recall, is a force that has to do with charged particles and the movement of those charged particles. A strong nuclear force is something you probably haven't talked about a little more and we'll actually define in a little more detail in a few minutes. Now let's take a look at how these forces work inside the nucleus and how they determine stability. To start this conversation, we're going to draw a quick picture of a nucleus over here on the left side of the screen. Uh, we're just going to draw a circle to represent the nucleus itself. And inside of that nucleus, I'm going to place a couple subatomic particles. In this case, we're going to start with two protons. Now I think you can see pretty quickly, now that the picture is drawn, what one of the forces at play is going to be. We've got two like charged particles, and if you recall from physics, like charges repel. And that brings us to our first force, which is the repulsion force. We're going to see a strong force pushing outwards from each of these due to the fact that these charges are like one another. You might also recall from physics that electromagnetism is a comparatively strong force. It is very powerful compared to the other four. Why that is is poorly understood, um, but measurement after measurement suggests that this is a very powerful force. To represent this, we're going to use the symbol F sub R, F standing for force, R standing for repulsion. So I've drawn in my force vectors, showing them pushing apart, and I've labeled them with the appropriate sign. Now, if this were the only force acting inside of our nucleus, I can clearly see that we're going to have a problem here. Unopposed forces would cause these protons to accelerate away from one another, making my nucleus no longer exist. There needs to be another force here to counteract the repulsion force. That second force is the strong nuclear force. Again, the force you probably didn't get a chance last year to talk about all that much. The strong nuclear force operates in the opposite direction. It is an attractive force between all nucleons. And it's also important to note that this force is very poorly understood. We know it's there. We know we can measure it. We don't know what causes it. 
Before I draw on the arrows, it's also important to note that it is a comparatively weaker force. Uh, despite what the name implies, the strong nuclear force, it is actually very weak. And as a result of that, we're going to draw on our force vectors much smaller than we drew from the repulsion vectors. So that's going to be pulling inwards, but with a less of a sh less strength. Uh, again, we can label these. We're going to label these as being F sub S in each case. Uh, the S sub S standing for that strong force. So we have our diagram. We've identified all our forces, but we still have a problem here. We still have a net outwards pushing force without the ability to compensate with our strong force. So the question at hand then is we still need to have these forces uh, be balanced for our nucleus to remain intact. One possible outcome here in terms of trying to balance these forces would be to add in another proton. But if we add another proton, it's going to make the problem even worse. We'll get even more of this powerful repulsion force and not enough of the strong force to compensate. So the question at hand then is what can we do to make our nucleus stable so that ultimately these forces are going to cancel each other out and the nucleus will remain intact? Well, the answer to that question comes in the form of our, la our second subatomic particle. We're going to add into our nucleus now some neutrons. When we add those neutrons in, those neutrons, uh, just like other forces, will contribute strong force. All nucleons inside the nucleus contribute to the strong force, the attractive force pulling things together. But neutrons don't have a charge. As a result of that, they are not going to push apart from one another. As we can see here then, when we add in that neutron, it contributes only to the strong force without adding more repulsion, and we would need to add enough neutrons so at the end of the day, this net strong force is going to ultimately cancel out the net repulsion force. So what we've really identified here is what the role of the neutron is inside the atom. One of the ways I like to describe a neutron is that's the glue that holds these subatomic particles together. We need to add enough neutrons into this process so that eventually they are strong enough to cancel out the very powerful repulsion force induced by the protons. So to sum this conversation up, We've identified two forces inside the nucleus. One is the repulsion force. This comes solely from the protons inside of the atom. The second force was our strong nuclear force, and this is contributed primarily by the neutrons, although all, sub all nucleons, all protons and neutrons do contribute to strong force. The magnitude or the strength of each force is connected back to the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Adding more protons is going to increase the repulsion force. Adding more neutrons is going to increase the strong force. And then ultimately, the role of that neutron is needed to overcome the difference between the, the powerful magnitude of the repulsion force and the relatively weak magnitude of the strong force itself. So let's wrap this discussion up by talking about whether the nucleus itself is stable based on the information we've already identified. As I've kind of hinted at a couple times now, stability comes from balance, the fact that the forces have to be balanced. And this is a similar concept to what you dealt with last year in physics. Ultimately, in a stable atom, we want our repulsion force to be approximately equal to the strong force. And when those two forces are equal, there's going to be no net movement of our protons and neutrons, and everything's going to stay inside the nucleus where it needs to be. As I mentioned, these, pro these forces are tied back to protons, and it's something we might have talked about in class already, the fact that there should be some sort of ideal ratio of protons to neutrons. By having the right number of protons and neutrons, that's going to mean we're going to have the right relative magnitudes of a repulsion force and the strong force. Now that ideal ratio isn't actually one thing, but actually represents a little bit of a range. Uh, we can get back to our idea of isotopes that we talked about previously. Uh, isotopes have already been defined, but we can redefine them a little bit in terms of the forces that we've just talked about here. These are all groups of atoms that have this of the same element with the same number of um, with the number of neutrons that adds to a mass that is close to this ideal ratio. So you can imagine that there's some sort of perfect number here of protons to neutrons. But that around that perfect number, there are different ratios that are still close enough to the ideal to result in a stable isotope. Um, some elements, so basically what we're getting at here is that atoms with a few more or a few less neutrons than that ideal ratio are still going to be relatively stable. So what we can identify here is the fact that um, there's really a range that we're talking about. And there's a, there is an ideal proton to neutron ratio, but realistically speaking, we can be anywhere near that ratio and still have, uh, still have stable atoms.
that's it for this particular video. Uh, in future videos, we're going to take this and turn it into a more practical skill. You'll be able to look at atoms, connect it back to ideas of this ideal ratio and the stronger repulsion forces, and be able to specifically predict the stability of the atom using uh, this information as well as the graph that we've made in previous classes.